we should be uh, excited uh, to use this data that has uh, policymakers debating uh, what to do in conflict and crisis uh, on paper in the archives in front of us. This is Sean Lynn Jones. I'm the editor of International Security, a quarterly journal based here at the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Today, I'm talking to Reed Pauley, who's a research fellow here at the Belfer Center, and is also finishing his PhD at MIT, and uh, is an incoming professor at Brown University. Reed is the author of an article that's just been published in International Security. It's called, Would U.S. Leaders Push the Button? War Games and the Sources of Nuclear Restraint. I read your article, and I've read it a few times, in fact, and it really presents a fascinating account of war games that took place during the Cold War involving U.S. policymakers. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how those war games worked. Yeah, so war games are uh, simulations that pit military forces uh, against each other uh, in any uh, uh, crisis or conflict that has uh, simulated uh, uh, rules uh, or regulations, data or procedures that would be simul similar to uh, any uh, uh, hypothetical or real life uh, crisis or conflict. Militaries have been using war gaming for uh, decades, uh, generations, uh, to test military plans before they are ever uh, used if they have to be used. The war games that you looked at were political military war games. What's distinctive about that kind of war game? In the nuclear age, uh, political military war games emerged when civilian strategists got hold of this uh, war gaming methodology. Uh, and they started to ask questions uh, that were beyond just operational questions of uh, testing war plans. They wanted to know uh, how do uh, adversaries receive signals in crisis or um, uh, what, uh, what does uh, it mean to move military forces on a battlefield under the shadow of nuclear war. So the key thing, these aren't war games that are just simulations of a military conflict. There are simulations of diplomacy and negotiating all under the shadow of nuclear weapons. Correct. What was the central question you were trying to answer as you looked at the uh, records of these war games from the 1960s? I'm trying to answer the question, why have nuclear weapons not been used since 1945? And in many ways, it's a central question to the study of international relations. Uh, did nuclear weapons change international politics at all? How do other scholars answer that question? I assume someone else has looked at it. Is there a conventional wisdom? To the extent that there's a conventional wisdom, it might be deterrence, that uh, the United States fears that if it uses nuclear weapons, that it will be retaliated against with nuclear weapons, and therefore it is, it is deterred from using them. So other scholars have already started to answer this question of why nuclear weapons have not been used. What can we learn from war games that adds to this knowledge and helps us to resolve that puzzle? Political military war games, especially, uh, that were conducted during the Cold War, have elite research subjects in them. These are policymakers that are playing these simulations uh, and debating, in many cases, whether or not to use nuclear weapons. Uh, and so this is an opportunity, a rare opportunity we have, to observe policymakers uh, debating the use of nuclear weapons, and they are more similar than the general public uh, to those who could hypothetically be in a situation uh, as to whether to recommend or not the use of nuclear weapons. So what do the records of the war games tell us about your central question? In a nutshell, what's your answer to the question, why didn't U.S. leaders push the nuclear button? The main finding is that policymakers uh, were quite reluctant to use nuclear weapons in these political military war games. Uh, and uh, the, the argument is that uh, they are more attuned as uh, elite uh, 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 research subjects to uh, the logics of non-use, uh, uh, not only deterrence, but things like practicality, uh, the, the notion that we have conventional alternatives that uh, uh, this crisis you know, that they're in hypothetically doesn't require nuclear effects. Um, uh, they're also more attuned to the logic of reputation, uh, is the main finding, that uh, they understand that uh, there are more than just material uh, consequences to the use of nuclear weapons, the way deterrence says, but that there would be reputational consequences for breaking the nuclear taboo. 
In the real world, we haven't seen nuclear weapons used in war since 1945. And we haven't had a nuclear war between two nuclear powers, fortunately. In the war games you studied, did the simulated conflict ever escalate to a nuclear exchange? Yes, so the major takeaway is that uh, it rarely escalated to a nuclear exchange. I have 26 uh, war game reports uh, out of a much larger number of games that I've seen, but 26 that classified as games where they were open-ended enough for uh, uh, the players themselves to decide whether to use nuclear weapons. And in only two out of these 26 games did the players themselves choose to employ nuclear weapons. Why do you think that happened in those cases? What we see uh, is that uh, players saw uh, many reasons uh, that the use of nuclear weapons would be costly. Uh, not only uh, that they would be deterred, that potentially uh, they could be uh, subject themselves to retaliation with nuclear weapons, but even in games where they were playing against non-nuclear armed adversaries, they saw potential costs like reputational costs. Uh, there were both costs for my country, uh, that, that if uh, my country or my team breaks the nuclear taboo, that world opinion will turn against us, but also personal uh, reputational costs. People saying things like, I did not want to be the warmonger that brought up uh, the nuclear option. Yes, it's mildly surprising that in these war games, it wasn't just fear of nuclear retaliation that prevented the uh, decision makers from pushing the nuclear button. Were there any other surprises that you encountered in your research? Yes, I was particularly surprised uh, by this group decision-making uh, reputation uh, logic. I was also surprised to find uh, what I call conformity, which is not a theory that, that um, folks have mentioned in the literature so far, but conformity to top-down signals in the sense that uh, if I thought that the president was unlikely to ever use nuclear weapons anyways, then why should I uh, even bring up the option? Right? So, so some conformity, regardless of what my true beliefs or feelings are, some conformity to top-down signals. Very interesting that you found that, and it's uh, interesting that you uncovered some of the reasons for nuclear non-use. Is there anything else we can learn from these war games? Yes, I think war games can teach us a lot about strategic behavior of any kind. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, they should not be used to predict the future or even how a conflict is likely to play out. Uh, but as scholars, we should be uh, excited uh, to use this data uh, uh, the, that has uh, policymakers debating uh, what to do in conflict and crisis uh, on paper in the archives in front of us. Uh, it adds to the data we have as scholars to look back and try and understand uh, what uh, uh, is right and what is wrong about our theories of international politics. So I'd like to thank you for being here with us today, Reed. I've been talking to Reed Pauley. He is a Belfer Center Fellow in the International Security Program here at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's completing his PhD at MIT, and he is going to be an assistant professor at Brown University. His article, which appears in the fall 2018 issue of International Security, is called, Would U.S. Leaders Push the Button? War Games and the Sources of Nuclear Restraint. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me.